Well, folks, I've wanted to get him on for a long time. Russell Brand, who is a comedian, best-selling author, uh, actor, TV host, you name it, who has been popular for many years, but he's really a sensation now. The whole office today, when they found out he was coming on, <laughs> got really excited. We have a lot of, a lot of big guests on. Uh, and, and what's exciting about uh, this is that uh, Russell Brand is outside the box, and, and he's getting people to think. And obviously it went viral all over the world uh, a few months ago when he confronted uh, kind of the talking heads uh, that are on the uh, mainstream media MSNBC channel with Mika Brzezinski. And so Russell Brand, he's doing his uh, worldwide tour right now, joins us. Russell, thanks for giving us some time. Alex, it's a privilege to be on your show. Thank you. Oh, it's a privilege to have you here. What's the best site for people to visit to find out about the, the uh, tour? Is it russellbrand.tv? Yeah, that'd be perfect. Thanks. You bet. W wow. So uh, bottom line, what is front and center most important to you right now that's happening in the world? I think the thing that is most important to me is the thing that I'm talking about in my show. It's the cultural narratives that we are told, the way that we are presented with information, the way that meaning is designated, the significance that is given to certain issues and not to others, and the light in which stories are told. So I think that that could obviously comprise uh, Edward Snowden, or it could comprise Syria. It could comprise more broadly the manufacture of consent or the manipulation of the consciousness of civilization through a conglomeration, conglomeration of government, big business, and media. Coming into this interview, we played a clip uh, when you were on MSNBC, and that really struck a chord with people when you just laughed at their narcissism and said, you don't talk about anything real. You're basically a bunch of peacocks up here. Uh, what was it like behind the scenes? And, 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 and it seemed like you were clashing with them uh, and, and it really captured people's imagination. What what happened there? Because you were in the middle of it. Well, I mean, it's, it's quite typical when you go on those type of TV shows that there's a particular frequency or pitch to the interview. There is a normal manner of speaking. Not only the type of topics that are discussed, but the kind of uh, banal, slightly shrill tone that the, the information that is predicated on celebrity and gossip and what I would call low frequency data, low vibration information. So like it was like that. So it's like that when you go on anything on mainstream television. Those programs all sound the same. People all look the same. They all talk in the same way. And it was that kind of atmosphere. Um, the only difference was is that the, 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 the impoliteness was at such an extreme level that. It, gave me an opportunity to point out some of that stuff, which I wouldn't typically do because it sometimes doesn't seem appropriate to tell people that what they're doing is pointless or silly. I want to get into world events, your tour that's so popular that I hope to see when you come to Austin in a few weeks uh, here in Texas. But just getting back to that, they genuinely seemed extremely uncomfortable, but the women also seemed very sexually excited and were not not faking it. I mean, I could tell that somehow you absolutely like broke the spell of their self-centered petty narcissism. And I'm not kissing your butt. I mean, it really happened. That's a magic clip uh, from my perspective. You've become nervous. Why oh, yeah. oh, are you nervous? Really? No, I'm, you're a powerful woman. You've oh, got a lovely yes. job. What seems to be the trouble? I don't know. You've got a hair like Princess Diana. Oh, wow. Uh, Is this what you all do for a living? Yes. We're going to be uh, talking about the, uh, the talk, uh, situation with Edward Snowden, this whistleblower. Is it good what he's done for America or or are our secrets being jeopardized by his intentions? We're going to be talking about that. Why do you think you shook him up so bad? I don't know. I'm a bit confused by it because I just went on there and did what I normally do, is just be polite. And then if I point out something that's idiosyncratic or weird, I observe that. But don't you think, Alex, that sort of you deal with so much duplicity, whether in a situation where you're in an interview on the TV or on the radio, or if you're making a purchase in a shop? It's sometimes we lose our authenticity, our ability to be human and truthful with one another. So I think if you interact in a very human and truthful way, then that uh, can be very disruptive.
You know, and sure. I think it's not like that there are certain individuals that are good and certain individuals that are bad. I know myself that, you know, I work in films and I've worked a lot in media, so I must be culpable as well for propagating these ideas and supporting them in my own way and on a bad day. Like just now, uh, I arrived uh, at Seattle Airport and there were people that wanted autographs and they were the kind of people that sell the photographs on afterwards, you know, they like, you know, they for eBay, they don't want them for themselves, they want them for it to sell on eBay. And I just, I couldn't be bothered to sign them, I just didn't feel like doing it, you know. And that's, but that's not the absolute best aspect of me as a person. The person I aspire to be will always sign everything for everyone, you know. So, like, I'm capable in myself of being selfish, egocentric, and uh, self obsessed and self centered. But, like, I think it's more of a problem when you have a massive machine of that conducts consciousness and orchestrates the way that we think en masse that has a set of priorities and an agenda that is making people in huge numbers think in a selfish, insular, atomized, apathetic, and impotent way. Wow. Uh, man, I tell you, you're on fire. It seems like you have uh, really uh, had an awakening. I mean, I, I mean, you've been awake for a long time, but it seems like your awakening uh, is accelerating. Is that is that accurate to say? Yeah, I think you might be right, as a matter of fact, Alex. I mean, like, uh, for me, spirituality is an important component. I, I, I meditate a lot, and uh, I practice certain spiritual principles that mean I have to be very mindful one day at a time about the way I live my life. I'm like a drug and alcohol free. And the more that I've uh, detached myself from the things that I thought would make me happy, like money and fame and other people's opinions, the more truth is being revealed. Ah, that is pure veritas. Uh, because that's been my experience as well. And what you were just talking about, just being aware that you're being selfish or doing things that are self-centered or narcissistic is, is half the battle. Most of the people out there, especially that are in the mainstream media, they are purely turned over to the narcissism and are like biological androids. They're not even real. And I think that's why you freaked uh, Brzezinski's daughter out and others so much is because they got into this conscious of the manipulation they were involved in, but really what you do to others comes back on you. So now they've turned into what they tried to do to the public, making the public one dimensional cutouts of what they projected. It's now blown back on them. That's very interesting. I wonder how, I often wonder, Alex, how those situations are contrived. I sort of suppose if you work in the media, you go through so many filters, you know, you're just not going to get that kind of job unless you're a certain type of person, unless you know the right sort of people. If you say the wrong type of things, you'll be filtered out, you know, so by the time you get to the point where you have your own show, generally speaking, you think a certain way that is in alignment with the elitist interests that are behind whatever corporation owns the outlet. Yeah, but like, I think too that there is probably a less obvious way of understanding things in terms of, I wonder what happens neurologically. I wonder what the energy in a brain looks like. I wonder what that is like if, if our brains are surrounded by other brains that are thinking in a certain way, that are broadcasting, transmitting at a certain frequency. You know, like that, this is what I feel like we have is a sort of a situation where there's such a strong and hypnotic message that exist not just externally, but more worrying internally. I'm always more worried when I find my... That's why I don't like it when I transgress my own personal principles, because I think, well, then I'm not behaving in accordance with what I believe in. I'm policing myself. You know, if I'm selfish, then I'm part of the problem. You know, like Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. So really all I can control is that I treat people well, you know? Absolutely, and... You know, thinking about that, the establishment is aware of the group consciousness, the group collective, and they're trying to program it, as you said, on record. They've written books about it to lower the frequency down to a bestial or even below bestial level uh, beyond common sense, even self-preservation, so that people can be programmable. So it comes down to the old uh, question of free will versus not free will. And I think that's how you can tell the good guys from the bad guys. If someone wants to expand consciousness, awakening, understanding, and empower people, then that means they're on the good side. If they want to shutter the horizons uh, and, and, and put walls around the mind, that's the bad guys. And from what I've heard, it's gotten amazing reviews, sold out in many places in the world. Messiah Complex, Revolution of Consciousness Tour. You're attempting to show people what different perspectives or windows into this. Describe it for us. 
galaxies are used as navigational points certain uh, personal heroes of mine. I talk about um, Malcolm X, Che Guevara, Gandhi, and Jesus Christ, and how each of those characters represent certain traits, certain human facilities that are oppressed and have been lost from our cultural narrative. Like that you can't have figures like Gandhi, Che Guevara, and Malcolm X being celebrated in the mainstream because you would then have an insurgent population. If people start to think like Malcolm X, they're not going to tolerate being treated as a compliant consumer cattle. If people think like Che Guevara, they're going to be prepared to take up an armed struggle. If they think like Gandhi, they're, going to, they're not going to be seduced by consumerism and they're going to be prepared to protest en masse. I also point out that all those individuals are flawed. Che Guevara was a, you know, a famously quite a brutal man and kind of homophobic and Malcolm X had a sort of a difficult criminal past and uh, Gandhi had some domestic and personal issues that are complex and I point out that all these free people are human and therefore flawed but that does not negate the positivity of their message. I also say that while we have lost these icons, lost these heroes and indeed seen them appropriated in a corporate context, the posthumous image of Gandhi is used to sell Apple computers, Che Guevara crops up at Mercedes, uh, at Mercedes car exhibitions, is because we're, we're in a situation where our heritage, our, our cultural myths and our stories that keep us bonded and unified and to a degree, I don't know, human are being lost and subjugated because as long as human beings are in a state of fear and a state of stimulated desire, we will always be beholden to the elites, we will always be hold, beholden to the corporate interests that offer to resolve these problems by selling us products. I've got to keep it funny, Alex, so I have to talk about sex every few seconds as well. Wow, Russell Brand is joining us right now on the road, part of his international uh, tour. And, you know, speaking of getting people outside the box, uh, from my own research, you're absolutely on target at the core here that the establishment is expert at hijacking icons or, uh, as uh, Campbell wrote, uh, archetypes, archetypal images, and then twisting them towards their aim and then really uh, rewriting all the basic cultural knowledge that every group out there had and replacing it. Uh, basically only with the New World Order's uh, propaganda. I, I mean, nothing against basketball players or movie stars, but if that's what kids aspire to be, there's not many slots there. But by making those people the icons artificially and making that the only thing that matters, then kids will never think about being a revolutionary or never think about uh, standing up nonviolently to oppression or never uh, think about the fact that they could change the course and be an example to others. And so I really get from this that you're trying to almost go back and see what these people really stood for and try to get folks to become aware of this power. Yes, exactly, Alex. I look at some corporate slogans like McDonald's, loving it, which is kind of meaningless and empty and an exploitation of an interesting piece of language to do with love. I look at uh, Diet Dr. Pepper and their slogan, unbelievably satisfying and how ridiculous and hyperbolic that is. Even the slogan of Gillette razors, the best a man can get, I can immediately point out that this is setting the, low very, the bar very, very low for humankind and for mankind. The kind of language used and slogans used by Malcolm X by any means necessary. Che Guevara, it's better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. And Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. These messages are subjugated. Furthermore, these heroes I offer replaced gods. And gods themselves are symbols of certain traits and ideas. Indigenous faiths typically are pagan, which means they worship the earth and their environment. If you have a culture of people like the Celts that worship and revere rivers, how will you feel when corporations want to pollute your rivers? If you have an indigenous faith like the Nordics who revere the noble oak tree, how will you feel about deforestation? If you have people like the native people of this country that revere and worship the earth and soil, how will you feel when people say that fracking is a good idea and necessary? It means that we've lost our narrative that ties us to our actual reality, our authentic reality as part of nature, not living separate from nature, but part of nature. Sure, they get us... It gives us a narrative where we live in accordance with uh, elitist interest. Wow, so they get us to sell out for light beer and uh, blue jeans 
uh, as they uh, say in uh, a, a recent popular film, and then we're not satisfied by the light beer and blue jeans. Folks, go to russellbrand.tv to find out if they can still get tickets in their area of the world. Russell, where else are you going now on the tour, and, and, and where, where was the, your favorite place you visited uh, since you got on the road? Well, I've, I've been all over Canada and had a great time there. I'm currently in... I've been just come from San Francisco. That was fantastic. And I'm in Seattle now. I'm going to Portland. Then I'm going to be back in my country for a few days. And uh, then, uh, like, I'll be in sort of New York and Florida and Austin, Texas. I'm enjoying all of it, really. I mean, you know what it's like when you're touring. You don't spend an awful lot of time in any one location. So, but, like, uh, I really love America and love being with the American people and, and, and find that, Broadly speaking, American media and American politics is not representative of my experience directly with American people. Sure, absolutely. It's a fake projected culture that the world sees that is not even America. It's like New Yorkers still move to Austin or still visit Texas and think we ride horses to work and that and we're all the Beverly Hillbillies. In the 10 minutes we've got left, Russell, I want to go over some of the world events with you that are happening right now, like Syria. But first, what do you think is happening in the media revolution? Because mainstream media is dying. Every metric shows that. Alternative media, the people's media, with its real diversity, is exploding. I want to get your take on where you think the future of the media is going and cultural developments. And do you think that the human species will survive uh, to become a type one civilization and make it off the planet? Civilizations. Oh, cool. What does that mean? That we get our, our own extraterrestrial operations go in and populate other planets. Well, with Alex, well, what I think with uh, like the media stuff is that um, I, I think that yeah, I think the diversity provided by social networking and, and new media is very very positive. But like uh, the the status quo are expert at manipulating and co-opting any countercultural movement. If you look at how hip hop began as a very sort of radical anti-establishment uh, voice and eventually became, couldn't be more about consumerism and bling and wealth. The same thing happened with punk. You know, so I think any countercultural movement is at risk of being uh, approximated and appropriated by the mainstream. And I think we, we sort of see already the way that sort of safe social networking is in cahoots with, with uh, the government and with uh, the whole prism affair that, you know, like it's going to be very difficult for, for truly radical new media to survive, particularly if it's effective. So, but I, but I feel very optimistic about it. And the more that people communicate, the more that people realize that even if we are different from one another, we have more in common with each other than we do with the people that rule us and govern us, then I think that we have a chance of changing the world. I think we do. Uh, I hear buzz about Russell Brand all over the place, mainly in new media. And I know the system wants to try to shut it down. I don't think the genie can be put back in the bottle. I, I know you don't like talking about yourself specifically in your meteoric rise, but I don't really follow even pop culture. I see it there when I tend to look at it, but I also see it on the streets, which is really what's evergreen. Uh, why do you think you're getting so much more popular? Um. Well, I don't know, but like I, 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 I hope that it's, you know, obviously I hope, Alex, that it's a, as a result of um, moving away from, uh, moving out of alignment with the messages and narrative of mainstream media and being truthful to my sort of, you know, my original intentions when I became a stand-up comedian as a sort of being inspired very much by men like, Bill Hicks and Lenny Bruce and Richard Pryor, who made uh, Telling the Truth funny, which I may not have done in this interview, but I assure you I do in my show. It's a very, very different kind of format. When I first started out, I was very interested in anti-capitalist protest and environmental issues, and, uh, and uh, sort of several of the occasions when I was arrested when I was younger was a result of uh, behaviour at sort of... Uh, you know, anti-capitalist marches and environmental marches and stuff. So it's, sort of, it's always been something that's in me, but now that I'm finally disillusioned and disenchanted with the spell of, uh, of mainstream popularity, perhaps something new can flourish. 
I, I didn't start living until I got disenchanted with it about 18 years ago. And I, and, and I just, my life gets better and better the more I realize it's almost like a matrix. It's fine to be on it, to use it, to try to wake people up. But other than that, that's the only thrill there. There's no thrill anymore just in the fake syntheticness of it. Russell, I want to talk about some good news from my perspective. Nobody's saying Assad's a good guy, but the West did start the war, did fund the rebels starting two and a half years ago. And for the first time, uh, since 1782, when the British Parliament voted to end the war against the colonies, they voted down uh, you, the prime minister in the UK, David Cameron, wanting to go to war. Uh, Obama, he has a 9% approval rating on this war in a Reuters Washington Post poll. I mean, when Bush did all these lies, he had a 72. Now it's very unpopular. I see this as a sea change where libertarians, conservatives, uh, liberals, Everybody I know sees through this and knows that it's about the takeover of the Middle East that Wesley Clark uh, exposed the seven nations they wanted to target. I went through the Pentagon 10 days after 9-11 and an officer from the Joint Staff called me into his office and said, I, I want you to know, he said, sir, we're going to attack Iraq. And I said, why? He said, we don't know. And then I came back to the Pentagon about six weeks later. I saw the same officer. I said, why, uh, why haven't we attacked Iraq? We still going to attack Iraq? He said, oh, sir. He says, it's worse than that. He said, I just got this memo from the Secretary of Defense's office that says we're going to attack and destroy the governments in, in seven countries in five years. We're going to start with Iraq, and then we're going to move to Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and Iran. What is your view on Syria, and uh, are you optimistic and, and excited that uh, the U.K. Parliament, for the first time in 200 years, did the right thing on war? I certainly agree with you that that vote is a result of widespread disillusionment with the political process. I, I think that, obviously, the Middle East is one of the most complex issues in uh, contemporary world affairs and has been for millennia. What I believe is that our focus has to be on the humanitarian aspects, the, the displaced refugees and the uh, hundreds of thousands that are suffering as a result of uh, uh, military conflict in that area. What I also believe, Alex, is that Got, these affairs are conducted behind a veil of disingenuity and duplicity. It's very difficult for any of us to understand what's truly happening. My experience tells me that, like, you know, whatever they are telling me, I intu intuitively don't trust. It's typically about the interests of big business and government and how they align with one another. So that's what I'm going to assume until I hear otherwise. Like, you know, the, the claims for going into Iraq and Afghanistan were duplicitous, and so my the starting point I have is going to be not to trust any um, any any advocacy of military action in Syria. Whilst it's not an issue that I can pretend to fully understand, it seems like it's extremely complex. That there are many factions fighting there. There's no clear goodies and baddies situation. Absolutely. Going on Ron Paul recently came out and said he basically thinks it's a false flag. There's evidence that the Al Qaeda groups staged the chemical attack. We're not really positive who uh, who set off the gas. The group that's most likely to benefit from that is. Al-Qaeda. I think it's a false flag. I think really indeed. Uh, it is obviously an incredibly complex situation. In closing, because this happens to me a lot every time I finish an interview, after it ends, there's something or a group of things I wish that I would have said. Russell Brand, we really appreciate your time. In closing, in a minute or two, any other key points that you'd like to put out there to the millions that will end up watching and listening to this? So I think probably you and me are coming at things from a sort of a different perspective. But me, I see uh, like my views are sort of more informed by sort of uh, socialism, even Marxism. But I think ultimately what we be believe in is freedom and truth. And I think that as long as people respect each other's differences, then I, I think and also acknowledge that we, the people struggling against oppression, have more in common with each other than we do than the people that control us. Then I think there's a chance for unity and change. Sure. I mean, I think that at a level you can see as a counter to the centralized corporatist uh, communism, socialism, but then you realize that they selectively use the deployment of collectivism to only create a permanent peasant class to control us uh, so that we never have come the libertarian view of the individual being empowered and having a giant middle class. I mean, what's your view of, say, libertarianism or Ron Paul? I mean, off air, you said that you were aware of my work. What's your, what's your view for folks of what I do? 
think that you're fantastic because uh, you're challenging authority and you're challenging the status quo, so I agree with you. But me, for, for me, the, uh, the number one pro priority for anyone who wants social change has to be the welfare of those most in need of it, the, uh, the support of society's poorest and most vulnerable. And for, for me, that's not socialism. That it's, you know, if anything, it's Christian, it's spiritual, it's, uh, you know, that's what I believe is the most important issue. I think if you're in a position of power and your priority is not helping the poor and the dispossessed, then you shouldn't be in power. You know, and now, of course, a healthy society across the board, uh, you know, is, and, and, and hierarchies are always going to be, to a degree, necessary. But for me, I, on a deep sure. human level, I feel our obligation is to help those that are suffering. Sure, you've got a giant Twitter account. Uh, what is it? Uh, Rusty Rockets. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, is there any other places on the web people should should visit other than that uh, and your uh, TV site? No, that's all cool for me, mate. That, that, I'll, uh, I already follow you and stuff, but let's keep this dialogue going, and I, I hope I see you in Austin. You bet, and I said that was the final question. One more, and I'll let you uh, get on down the rugs. I know you're at the airport. One last question I've got to ask you here, Russell. You you mentioned Jesus and Che Guevara and uh, Gandhi and Malcolm X, but it says, and Hitler, and that's one reason I want to see your show. This is such an icon that's used everywhere, but in your research, you got to give away a little bit. What's the angle on Herr Hitler? Well, that whilst uh, Hitler's actions were deplorable, it's not his extremism that is terrifying. It's his mundanity. He was just a normal man created by a, a number of geopolitical, economic, and religious circumstances. Their size. At that time yeah. in Germany. Yeah, of course, Versailles and the, and the anti-Semitism anti that was very prominent in that part of Europe at that time. And the, the, But now, we don't... Like, in those days, it was clear what evil was. Ah, oh, evil is Adolf Hitler. Now evil comes dressed as the, in the white of Ronald McDonald. Now evil <laughs> is hidden behind the Apple logo. Now evil is indecipherable in derivative bundles and in dispossessed millions. So, it's, again, it's about the narrative and the way we're told stories exactly it knows how to hide and deciphering it and knowing what evil is yeah is is really the answer russell brand thank you so much and i look forward to hopefully meeting you when you're in austin in a few weeks i'll be at your show regardless stay in touch alex i can't wait to see you thank you sir goodbye see you mate thanks bye-bye well, folks, there goes Russell Brand, and I had been told by David Icke that he was a listener, and we got a hold of him and discovered he was. And we found out he was following us on Twitter at Real Alex Jones and got him on, and I've been fascinated with his work for a few years. He's been around for a long time, but he certainly has gone from just kind of being the wild party animal guy uh, to being a uh, serious thinker. You can tell he's a smart guy. And look, folks, you know I don't like communism. But he's on a journey here. He said that was a long time ago. Now his views are changing. We have to reach out to everybody, especially if they're outside the box and want to try to make connections to others. And so this is how those of us that want true Thomas Jefferson style liberty are going to win the fight against the tyrants. But I tell you, that interview couldn't have gone better. That was amazing. And so uh, I know that uh, listeners out there uh, probably want to uh, send me their comments. You can do that at Real Alex Jones on Twitter. And then uh, later on in the broadcast, I will come back and uh, read over some of those. We'll also open the phones up later and get uh, your take on that amazing, uh, groundbreaking uh, interview with Russell Brand. And I hope this one gets eight and a half million views or whatever, like his MSNBC, because this will really get people thinking and talking. If him just shaking up those, uh, those cutout paper people... Uh, went so viral and spurred people's humanity. This will really get people talking. So please, folks, send this out when it's posted on YouTube to everyone you know. We'll be right back. I'm Alex Jones, and this is The Alex Jones Show. Check out our website, InfoWars.com. It is not new, and it is not order. 